Due Process, winner of 19 regional Emmy Awards, including the 2010 New York Emmy for our coverage of voting rights, and the 2011 Mid-Atlantic Emmy for outstanding discussion series. Due Process is a presentation of Rutgers School of Law in Newark and the Edward J. Blaustein School of Planning and Public Policy. Studio facilities provided by the Rutgers ITV Studio, Division of Continuing Studies. The first day coming out was like being reborn again, basically um, having a second chance and hope. But second chances come hard when you've served time, have a criminal record, and find yourself back on the street. No job, no money, no home, and few options. Prisoner re-entry and efforts to ease the way. Thank you. On this edition of Due Process. Major funding for due process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy. Prisoner re-entry. There aren't many problems more daunting, more destructive to individual lives and whole communities. Most to go to prison will be released unprepared for life outside, and so too many will wind up back behind bars. I'm Raymond Brown. I'm Sandra King, and it's no wonder that re-entry is now part of the public discourse. Programs initiated, solutions explored, from the streets to the statehouse. I'm calling for a transformation of the way we deal with drug abuse and incarceration in every corner of New Jersey. So today I ask this legislature and the Chief Justice to join me in this commitment that no life is disposable. I propose mandatory treatment for every nonviolent offender with a drug abuse problem in New Jersey, not just a select few. It will send a clear message to those who have fallen victim to the disease of drug abuse. We want to help you, not throw you away. We will require you to get treatment because your life has value. Every one of God's creatures can be redeemed. Everyone deserves a second chance. So even the governor knows that it's not working, wants to reform the way we deal with addiction and some drug-related crime. All a far cry from the decades of draconian drug laws that led to all too many scenes, like this one from the 1990s film, Slam. Those six digits on that band I told you about, they'll be here waiting for you if you ever come back. And get your ass out of that jail. A familiar scene oh. from countless films. The prison gates open, the protagonist walks out, and the drama hinges on how he'll use his freedom. All right, going out for but the dilemma isn't limited to the fiction of the movies. I came from nothing and then getting locked up, coming home, you have nothing. Every day, men and women leave real prisons with no job, no skills, the stain of a criminal record, and no plan. My first thought process was do what I did to get money, which is sell drugs. But I knew, I knew in my mind that it would get me back into the place where I was just at. Real help from a society that sees you as a danger, a threat, is too often absent, especially if your conviction was for drugs. You know, if you ain't got no family, you hit. Welfare and stuff, they don't really want to help you. If you got a drug conviction or whatever, they say they can't help you. You get charged with a drug charge, it's a wrap. Because you have a drug conviction, you're no good for the assistance that they have to offer. So it's no wonder that most of those released from prison will find their way back in. You know, it's a jungle out there right now, and um, you know, they're just throwing me into the lion's den, and I'm not prepared for that. You know, so I'm very uh, afraid of it. You know, I'm afraid uh, of failure. 
then how to break the recidivism cycle. Take treatment. What happened next? Uh, I got caught up with the CBS job. Okay. Tend trees. It's starting to bud now. Okay. But next month it should be sprouted out again. Or maybe shoot pictures. When I took that camera and I drove back through the neighborhood when I used where I used to be at, it was with a different point of view. I, and it's my first time going through there since I've been released. But, you know, it was a good feeling. I'm not going over there because I'm going to go drop somebody off a package. We gave them a digital camera and told them to go out in the community and answer three questions. What are the resources available to people re-entering the community? The challenges that people were facing? What are potential solutions to the challenges that they found? That picture right there, um, I was on my way for a job interview, my first job interview. You see, I was nervous. I was real nervous going to the job interview. But I, on my age that I went there, and you know, I've been myself, and they like me. After my 10 years of working inside prison, I can say they are no different from any other human being I've ever met. They are not cut from different a different cloth. They have been challenged by different experiences. They have made bad choices. This is what I used to clock in and clock out of. This was my job. Right before getting incarcerated, I had a baby. And um, due to my choices, my poor choices, I left it all behind. But like everybody else, I always look for the perfect excuse. The Rutgers Camera Project, just one approach to getting past the excuses, to repairing lives from the inside. Some of them don't even know how to use an ATM machine or haven't seen a laptop computer. While a movement grows to give more practical help from the outside. These right here is dying out, but we got new growth coming in now. Young men are going to prison and going in and out of prison at unconscionable rates, and we as a community are not doing nearly enough to break this cycle of recidivism, which is consuming the lives of too many who are caught up in this dangerous lifestyle, but also doing horrible collateral damage to our city. So the city's reentry program is just one of the efforts. And I just constantly be looking for work. To help ex-offenders through the trauma of starting over against daunting odds. This right here is the picture of a guy who was murdered downtown North. You know, this is what the community shows when they when they lose a loved one or something, they put balloons and try to um, leave some memory, some words of encouragement. But that may not be enough if you can't find a job. They may not have held jobs consistently before they went to prison. I never owned a credit card or nothing like that, so it feels good to have that, be a member of society, paying bills and paying taxes. They may have had drug issues. I'm not far at all from where I used to conduct all my drug business. So really one issue is, are they prepared for work? And the second issue is, is, is someone going to treat them fairly in an interview process because of their criminal record? Once they look at my record, they don't go. No. Nah. As soon as you say, I have a criminal history, people look at you totally different. I had jobs. Don't get me wrong, I had different jobs. But it's just that I guess the fast money came, and that got me into selling drugs. And from there, I got locked up. And I did, well, they gave me six years. I did three. So for Naima Evans, a chance at work experience. And you have to be careful, because you don't want to put too many in there came from the New Careers Program of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice and its partnership with both the city and the Newark Conservancy. It does not end in employment. And in fact, if we just throw people into jobs, they aren't going to succeed, or many of them aren't going to succeed. You say, I'm moving forward now, and this is what I'm doing. In fact, says Dave Kerr, a former parole officer who runs New Jersey's oldest and largest drug rehab, it has to start with some serious extended treatment for the vast majority of those trying to come out and stay out. What does the job do for an addict? Get some money to, to, to deal, to uh, buy dope. If they have a disease of addiction, they'll come back. You see, um, if, if an addict don't get the, the sufficient amount of time he needs. So jobs have to come after treatment. But for those who can get treatment and jobs, and that elusive second chance, there is hope.
We just need the opportunity to um, turn our life around and show people and society that we can change and we do want something out of life. I'm here to represent them guys who ain't got a choice not to come back, who ain't coming back. I'm not going back to prison, you know, and I'm living a productive life. And I thank you, and I thank everybody for this opportunity. Thank you. But can deciding that you're not going back make it so? With the odds so stacked against those leaving prison, can reentry be successful? Our guests, all working on the problem in different ways, say yes. Blaustein School Professor Nancy Wolf is director of the Rutgers Center for Behavioral Health Services and Criminal Justice Research. Cornell Brooks is CEO and president of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice, which has worked extensively on reentry initiatives, especially in Newark. And Jim McGreevy was once New Jersey governor, now a seminary graduate and reentry advocate with the prison ministry and a job at Newark's Integrity House. Welcome to all of you. Cornell, let me start with you. The idea of collateral consequences to conviction are hundreds of years old in the common law tradition and has some deep roots in American culture. On the other hand, for the last decade at least, you've been at the forefront of a movement in Michigan and New Jersey and elsewhere to really push this issue into the middle of the public discourse about our lives, about economics, about urban life, about race. Um, what's the best indicator that you can point to, especially if it's something empirical, that suggests that there's been some success in altering the reentry experience of men and women coming out of prison? Um, I would say that there's a growing uh, sense of awareness that this issue is not uh, simply a matter of them, but rather us. In other words, collateral sanctions is a underdiagnosed, underappreciated uh, criminal justice issue, but also an unrecognized civil rights issue. So for example, in the labor market, people face discrimination based on their criminal records, but they were the discrimination that they face is also a proxy for race. Uh, this is also an economic development issue. In other words, when we think about the concentration of ex-offenders in our cities and the fact that a male with a criminal record will lose $100,000 of income across his prime earning years. When we think about a concentration of people who are relegated to an economic subclass, the effect of that is not only an individual effect, but a family effect, a community effect, a city-wide effect. There's a growing awareness of this. Uh, the EEOC conducted hearings, uh, a hearing on this issue. It was the most widely attended hearing uh, of its kind. Uh, and it was understood on that day as not only a civil rights issue, but also an economic development issue. The fact that the Attorney General uh, has convened a, a cabinet level reentry council on this issue, uh, bringing to the table people concerned about the economic development of the country, the, the civil rights trajectory of the country um, speaks to the fact that there's a growing understanding that collateral sanctions Cornell, are critical. Cornell, no question it's now on the table sure. in a way that it wasn't previously. But I hear a kind of optimism from you. I wonder, Nancy Wolf, whether you share that optimism. You also work on this problem, and it does seem a most daunting one. I agree with you. It's daunting. I, too, am very optimistic. But what I'm hoping for is a different approach. I think that much of what we have done historically on the reentry issue has really focused on what are the problems, and I think it's time that we switch to who are the people. And reentry, to the extent that we're ever going to really respond in a holistic, successful way, means that we have to look at reentry as a human experience of people who have been confined for years, whose skill sets have depreciated, and are returning to communities about as ill-prepared as the communities are who will be receiving them. And it is for that reason that I think we have to look at this as a conjoint, uh, person-centered and community-centered response, where we focus first on the person and understanding the issue from the point of view of the person. I don't think that reentry is a problem. I don't think that it is a program. I don't think it's a philosophy. And I certainly don't think it's a way of making profits. I think it's a human experience that really requires that we work with the people, for the people, and by the people who are actually experiencing reentry. 
Jim, recognizing that we're in early in the arc of this movement, if since social change is part mm. of what we're doing, we're still looking for some benchmark, even though it's early. Um, obviously, from what we've talked about thus far, there are economic components, there are mental health components, there are drug rehab components, there are occupational uh, training components, there are a host of components, but where is there an indicator that we can point to that says this is at least a lead indicator or a lead area to push and we can demonstrate to the body public, which is ultimately yeah. going to have to buy into this, that this is a way to make progress and here's the evidence that we're doing it. Well, you know, just basing on what Nancy said earlier in the clip, and part of this is understanding that, and I have the honor and privilege of working with women in Hudson County, that some of their lives have been marred by sexual violence, by domestic physical violence, growing up in some of the toughest, grittiest areas in the state. And their response, I don't know if I would have had all that much different of response than they did. So I, I think go to what Cornell said, part of it's understanding from a theological perspective, from a civil rights perspective, these are fellow citizens. These are children of God that we drive past when we looked at those barbed wires and we drive past and we see state prisons and county jails. But I think some research, some objective research has been done. Uh, Columbia University, CASA did a, a great study called Behind Bars 2. And when you're looking at the number of people that are incarcerated, approximately 70% grapple with addiction in a real substantive way. In addition, another 70% are grappling with a fourth grade literacy level. So to go what Nancy said, we just can't let you walk out of the door, which drives me nuts. After keeping you in jail or prison where nothing good is happening. I mean, we, you know, it's one of the few areas where conservatives and liberals uh, agree that in jail it isn't punishment, nobody's breaking rocks, and for the progressives, no one's learning. Sean Pika has a great program called Hudson Link in New York State Prisons. A hundred percent of the men who've gone through his program who've earned a college education not one has come back to jail. And so Sean drives the linkage between education and the fact that people don't recidivate. So the, the point that I think that we have to go back to, to, to your question is, is if we begin to provide services in jail, to as soon as you walk inside the jail, to go back to Nancy's point, we're going to try to make you whole. We're going to talk to you about your addiction. We're going to talk to you about job training. We're going to talk about GED. But you can't do nothing for seven years or five years or 24 months, then give you a bus ticket and a blessing and say goodbye because you're going to default to the same thing you've always done. But Jim, can you even hand someone a job? If your colleague, Dave Kerr, is right, Nancy, he's, you heard him say, you give someone a job who's an addict and he believes that, as we all do, I think, that the vast majority of people who are in prison have addiction problems. You give somebody a job, all you're doing is giving them money for drugs. They will go back to the streets. They will go back to drugs unless you've got long-term years of drug rehab. How do you respond to that? I think we have to be very careful that we're not trying to fix people. And if that's the orientation, you'll easily get people turned off. Again, these are people. And the notion that we go, you have this problem, and this problem, and this problem, and this problem, and now's a chance for us to fix you. But if you have an addiction problem, doesn't it have to be fixed? Well, I think it has to be addressed. And I think there's lots of different types of addiction. I mean, most people talk about addiction to drugs. Most people that I know or that I've worked with, you may solve the drug addiction, but then they gamble or they um, choose fast living. There's lots of things that can be addicted to. So maybe there's even more to be fixed. Well, I think that we have to understand the person, and I think that what Jim had said is important, is that both women and men who are incarcerated have witnessed or experienced violence in their lives and have traumatic experiences, and that they are choosing behaviors that are coping strategies for dealing with the harm that they've experienced. Some people may numb out by alcohol or drugs. Some people may choose other mechanisms by which to do that. More and more practice um, is pushing in the direction for trauma-informed services that don't just say we're going to deal with the addiction, but let's deal with what's underneath the addiction so that we actually have trauma-informed services. Cornell, let me sort of bring this back to where we started. 
Um, the challenge is that while there's been a change in awareness, this conversation wouldn't have happened likely 15 years ago or 10 years ago. Except on due process. When, except maybe on due process, but in the wider <laughs> community. But Jim is talking about a study that points to education. Let's even translate that into skills. Nancy is talking about deeply addressing issues that result from people having to live in environments where their adjustments were what we would regard as pathological, they probably regard them too. I don't know how those interventions take place without redirecting resources in order to enable them to survive in an economy where jobs are scarce for everybody. So the question is, it's hard to see how the pieces fit together, whether it's a private public partnership that will drive the resources in the direction of these deep issues that affect everybody. Well, I think it's important to recognize that the barriers that the people uh, with criminal records face are both interior and exterior. There are internal challenges in terms of uh, drug abuse, uh, alcohol abuse, those kinds of things, but they're hard, real barriers uh, in the labor market. So when we think about the fact that uh, ex-offenders lower the national unemployment rate by as much as 0.9 percent, among African-American men over 5 percent, or among men in general 1.7 percent, that's an architecture of real exclusion. In other words, people enter the labor market and can't drive cabs because they have a criminal record. Since we're running low on time, I wanted to ask you about ban the box, which is something you are advocating as maybe a solution, though. Can you give us a quick so so thumbnail of what it is? A, a, a quick thumbnail would be this. We are proposing that the city of Newark and the state of New Jersey do what the federal government has long done which is inquire about criminal records at the point of a conditional offer. In other words, when uh, I was an attorney in the U.S. Department of Justice, I applied for the job, they interviewed me, they considered my resume, and at the point of an offer, that is the point in which they asked about my criminal record. Okay, but Cornell, is that really going to do the trick if, in fact, you can ultimately ask about a criminal record? Isn't that going to throw out that <laughs> applicant just as surely as if it were asked on the first uh, sheet that they had to fill out? What we, what, we've, what we found is that when an employer gets to know an applicant as more than an ex-offender, when a person has an opportunity to, to look at a person as a person, as a fellow citizen, they're more likely, not necessarily guaranteed, to consider that person a viable job applicant. Jim, you're a, you're a policy guy. <laughs> You buy that? Well, I, it helps. And I think what Cornell and I think what Nancy is saying, we, we have to do this differently. And when we look to the fact that you said in the beginning of the show that 95% of these men and women are going to come back onto the street. What frustrates me is we do some good work with integrity in Hudson County. Then these women go to Clinton or they go to another county jail. And as what Nancy said, we need the whole process uh, is driven by the crime. We focus, and I'm a former prosecutor, I worked in the parole board, I had the privilege of working with Governor Kane, but we focus on the crime. What I think Nancy's suggesting is we have to help make these persons whole. And so if we're just going to focus in on the systemic approach of our criminal justice system is crime driven as opposed to persons driven, we're never going to get there. And the frustrating thing, we can work with people for nine months with women, and then all of a sudden they go to Clinton or they go to another county, but there's not one judge pulling all of this together and saying, all right, what's your sentence, what's your treatment, what's your exit strategy? Let me, uh, we're at the end, so for intellectuals like you, it's an unfair so question. Who can give us 20 seconds each on the single thing that makes you most optimistic that 25 years from now we'll be looking at this issue differently? I think the thing that makes me most optimistic... One thing. One thing. The thing that makes me most optimistic is we've begun to appreciate that this issue of prison reentry is not a matter of individuals reentering society, but it's a matter of society literally redeeming itself. Nancy. I think the one thing is related, um, which is destigmatizing, being able to see the person for the person. And more importantly, which we haven't discussed, is empowering those individuals no matter where they are located. It's not that we're doing something to them. We are empowering them to, to take responsibility for their own journey, okay. for their own course and of unlike action. And like Nancy, you've got to give us one, not two. <laughs> um, money. We can't keep mm. affording to do this. And as a Christian, prayer. And there is so much more to say oh. on this subject. Thank but you for I'm doing this. Sorry Please. to say 
No More Time. Our thanks to Jim McGreevy, Nancy Wolf, and Cornell Brooks, and our hope that you will join us next week and every week on Due Process. Till then, won't you friend us on Facebook.com slash Due Process TV and watch us online at YouTube.com slash Due Process TV. For Sandy and all of us here, I'm Raymond Brown. Thanks for watching. Before that, well, I was running the streets and, 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 and just doing what I had to do to survive. You know, I wasn't really looking for a job or nothing like that because there was no jobs out there. So I was either selling drugs or, or, or robbing or stealing. I had different jobs, but it's just that I guess the fast money came and that got me into selling drugs. And from there, I got locked up and I did, what well, they gave me six years. I did three out of the six. From there, I came home on parole, and my parole officer is the one who introduced me to new careers, and that got me to work for the Greater North Conservancy. I just feel good, relaxed. It seemed like this guy just gave me a new, a new beginning, like I've been born again. process provided by the New Jersey State Bar Foundation, committed to educating the public about the law, and by the Fund for New Jersey, supporting informed citizens for an effective democracy.